My name is Bob Newton. I am the acting director of the church in the 21st Century Center. Uh, a lot of you probably know about the center was begun. We're now in our 12th year. Uh, it was begun in reaction to the clerical sexual abuse crisis uh, in Boston by Father Leahy, the president of Boston College. And uh, over the years, we've, we've uh, had over 65,000 people come to events like this. Um, we publish a, a C21 resources, which is, uh, creates a central theme each semester uh, for the not only uh, something that you can read, but also for the programs that we have. And everything that we, uh, every program we have is videotaped so that if you have friends who were unable to come, they will be able within two weeks to go to the C21 website and uh, view the presentation for tonight. My, my role is very brief. It's to introduce the introducer. Uh, <laughs> So I will stop right now and let, uh, and I will introduce uh, Connor Kelly, who worked very closely with Father Himes in producing the, the issue that I hope all of you have received. If you haven't, there, there are copies on the back staircase. So, Connor. Well, I'd just like to echo Bob's words of thanks to having all of you join us here this evening for what promises to be an informative and thoughtful discussion of poverty in its ecclesiastical, practical, and theological dimensions. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you my colleague, friend, and mentor, Kenneth, Father Kenneth Himes, who is indisputably the perfect person to be talking to us this evening about poverty in conjunction with the current issue of C21 resources available out back, uh, which he was the guest editor for. Indeed, when the church in the 21st Century Center decided to respond to Pope Francis's call for a church that is poor and for the poor by dedicating this issue to the question of poverty, there was absolutely no question about who should be the ideal editor. As an associate professor in the theology department, and a renowned scholar with wide-ranging expertise in social ethics, Father Himes certainly has the appropriate scholarly credentials to tackle this issue with aplomb, and he did. Among his many publications, he, <clears throat> he's the author of numerous works touching on the challenge of poverty, including the well-known 101 Questions and Answers on Catholic Social Teaching, and the award-winning Christianity and the Political Order, available in a bookstore near you, shameless plug. <laughs> Similarly, recent articles in theological studies on consumerism and inequality speak to his facility with the issues and questions that surround poverty in today's world. Beyond his academic credentials, which are indeed impressive, Father Himes has exceptional personal qualifications for this particular job. First, he has a clear mode of thinking and conscientious work ethic that can be seen in the comprehension and cohesion of the articles he selected for this issue of C21 resources. Second, he is a Franciscan, and so has a certain credibility when it comes to issues of poverty. No offense meant to your housemates in the Society of Jesus. <laughs> and finally, I would say most importantly, Father Himes has a level of generosity that is only possible as a result of a personal commitment to intentional poverty, a fact I know very well, for I was once his teaching assistant. For all these reasons and more then, I ask you to join me in welcoming Father Kenneth Himes to share his wit and wisdom with us in a talk entitled, The Poor, What Did Jesus Preach? What Does the Church Teach? Ken. Applause is always much more uh, welcome at the end of talks than at the beginning of talks. Uh, uh, listening to Connor, his very kind remarks, I, uh, I, I sort of remember my, uh, my mother's uh, advice to my sister when she first started using perfume. Uh, she said, uh, sniff a little bit, 
appreciate it, use it sparingly, but for God's sakes, don't swallow any of it. And uh, <laughs> so I, uh, uh, whether I'm the ideal person for this uh, talk, I am not at all convinced, but uh, I'm here and you are, so I'll talk, all right? Uh, when I was first asked to do this, and to do this issue of uh, C21 Resources, uh, uh, Bob Newton, Karen Kiefer, Eric Goldschmidt was here then, uh, they talked to me about the topic of poverty and the poor, and said, we think you'd be the right person to do this. Uh, I wasn't sure of that, but the truth is, I knew exactly what I did want to do with the issue, if I were to say yes to it. And then they said to me, and you can also have an assistant to work with you on that. And immediately I knew who I wanted to do that with, and that was Connor. And I figured, well, with Connor's uh, hard work and intelligence, and uh, the ideas of Bob and Karen, and Karen's responsible for the beautiful visuals and the layout of this magazine, I figured, and with my propensity to take credit for everything, this was going to be a great team, and it would work out fine. Uh, but what I knew I wanted to do right away was to uh, use C21 resources to show the depth and the consistency of the Christian tradition's concern for the poor. Uh, and so I began to think immediately about uh, putting together something that would sort of, uh, sort of back up and demonstrate the consistency and depth of that commitment by doing something in the Old Testament and then the New Testament and then the patristic era and then the late patristic early medieval era and then the high medieval era and then the Reformation era and the Renaissance. And I realized that I was now up to about 800 pages and uh, <laughs> hadn't even gotten to the modern era. So I realized I couldn't do things simply chronologically. Uh, but I still wanted to do something that reflected uh, the diversity of viewpoints within the Christian tradition and uh, something that showed the kind of comprehensive breadth that the topic of the poor and poverty uh, uh, calls for within the Christian tradition. And so what I settled on was that we would look at the topic through various forms of poverty. And that's really what I want to talk with you a little bit about tonight, in terms of how the Christian tradition has thought about poverty in terms of its various guises. Because the term poverty evokes different ideas uh, in different thinkers and writers and activists within the Christian tradition. And spend a little time thinking and talking about that with you tonight, or this evening. It might be tonight by the time I'm finished, so that's a warning. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, poverty was more commonly viewed as a social condition than an economic one. Uh, that is, it was sometimes, sometimes it was treated in the context of a lack of goods or of the reality of beggardom in uh, the ancient world. But of course, for much of the ancient Near East, uh, we are dealing with the subsistence economy. Right? A certain lack of goods was hardly a distinguishing characteristic uh, for most people. Almost everyone lacked material goods. Most people lived on the margins of subsistence. Right? And so in the Old Testament, really what you find is this social idea that poverty is linked to the experience of being weak being dependent, being inferior, indeed being oppressed. Israel knew this condition. Its slavery in Egypt was paradigmatic for the Israelites. Its struggle with the Philistines and Canaanite tribes as it moved into Palestine. Its experience with the empires of Assyria, Babylon, and Rome. The Jewish people knew firsthand and regularly the experience of being humbled, being weak, being oppressed. And so in the Old Testament you find three views. One, there is an appreciation 
of the secular wisdom of the world at the time, that saw poverty as a consequence of laziness. Poverty came about because of foolish behavior, because of idleness. And yet, the Israelite people were wise enough to realize that's not quite the whole story. And so there was a second, more theological rendering of poverty. Poverty was seen as divine retribution. It was punishment for Israel's infidelity. Poverty is evil, but it has been sent by God to chastise Israel for its transgressions against the covenant. Now, to the Israelites' lasting credit, they saw the inadequacy of that view as well. They came to realize that many unrighteous and unjust people make out fairly well in this world. And indeed, many poor and neglected people go to their graves suffering with, not their, with their poverty unrelieved. And so they came to see poverty as a scandal. Poverty was not the condition that ought to be. Poverty ought not be accepted as normal or acceptable. It should be resisted. It ought to be overcome. And in the Old Testament, this is done chiefly in two ways. First, by almsgiving and by concern for that famous biblical trinity, the poor, the widow, the orphan, or I might say instead of the poor, the exile, the widow, and the orphan, the refugee in our midst. And secondly, by prayer and lamentations made to God, imploring God for relief and assistance to the poor. In this view, God had a special attachment to the poor. And indeed, God measured the faith of others by how they treated the poor. And this, you see, is where it's so important to think in terms of that trinity of widow, orphan, exile, or refugee. In a world that was ordered around patriarchy and tribe, to be a widow, a woman, without a male heading her household, to be a child and without a male protector or guardian, to be a refugee and to be outside the normal bounds of the tribe's concern for its own, this is to make one thoroughly isolated and alienated. This is to make one marginalized in the midst of people. To be a widow, an orphan, an alien was simply another way of talking about marginalization and oppression. And the Old Testament comes to see that the treatment of that trio becomes the test for whether or not one is being faithful to Yahweh. All of those viewpoints coexist within the Old Testament. We can find multiple passages in the Old Testament that back up one or the other of those three approaches to poverty. From the outset, when we move to the Christian community, what we find is that community has wrestled with the realities of poverty and the poor right from the get-go. Early disciples of Jesus and members of the early Christian communities were not among the elite of their societies. They were not the top 1%. They weren't even the top 5%. Likely as not, they were largely small farmers, urban tradespeople, who were poor in the sense that they were never far from economic disaster. A drought, an illness, a war, or some other social calamity. They simply lacked the reserves to get them through hard times. The truly destitute, street beggars, widows, and orphans, 
day laborers. These people were truly at the bottom of the pyramid. And some of these were also Christian. The elites in the New Testament, when one looks at it, are often viewed negatively in the parables. Think of the rich man and Lazarus, or the rich fool who builds bigger barns to store up his wealth. Jesus, as we know, preached in parables that touched upon the reality of poverty in the everyday lives of his listeners. In the Acts of the Apostles, there are scenes of the early church struggling with how to think about possessions. The famous passage where Barnabas is praised for selling a piece of property and bringing the proceeds of that sale and placing it at the feet of Peter to be distributed to the other members of the community as the needs arise. And that was contrasted with the example of Ananias and Sapphira, that first sort of couple who have lived in Trump Tower, who sell their property and, of course, come before Peter and put out part of the proceeds, but keep a little back for themselves. And as God was one to in those days, he struck them down dead at the moment of, <laughs> it happened. We're glad that God has earned, learned patience with us as the years have gone on. In several letters of Paul, right, we find Paul appealing to the Gentile communities to take up collections that he could bring back and help the poorer Jerusalem community in their situation. We also find Paul preaching in Corinth about the scandal of rich and poor celebrating Eucharist apart from one another. What happened, of course, was as the Corinthian church grew in numbers, they couldn't assemble all in one place. So there began to be house churches and house assemblies as the community celebrated in different locales. But in some of those locales, the poor were not welcome to come. In some of those locales, the poor were not invited because the richer members of the community took to the practice of having a festive meal along with their celebration of the Eucharist. And Paul excoriates them for not understanding the meaning of Eucharist. If you can divide the community the way that practice does. And James, in his letter, scolds a Jewish Christian community because it overlooks its poorer members while it fawns over a rich man who enters the room. The constant refrain in the New Testament texts is not that of political reform or of new economic structures. These are not realistic options in the Roman Empire for the Christian community. But what must be done and expanded upon is the idea of the works of mercy, extended even beyond the borders of one's ethnic group. Gentile, Jew, Gentile Christians have obligations to Jewish Christians and vice versa. But also, of course, even extended beyond one's religious group as Christians began to move out into the wider society and cities of the empire and still maintain the practice of charity to the needy. In short, the neighbor becomes anyone in need. Now later Christians, hermits, theologians, monks, mendicants, mystics, social reformers, spiritual writers, they're all there, right? All of them had added their voices to this discussion of poverty within the Christian tradition. At times, it's praised as a virtue. It's blessed as a condition. And that's part of what's new in the New Testament, that poverty is actually seen as a blessing in the New Testament. But at other times, it's opposed as a social evil. It's cursed as a burden. Poverty has elicited many kinds of reactions. Now, part of what accounts for the range of viewpoints is that poverty refers to different realities. So it would be useful to point out the various meanings of poverty. Theologically, I would like to suggest to you the most fundamental reality of poverty is that of creatureliness. 
in a very real sense, theologically, to be human is to be poor. This is the essential poverty of finitude. Not one of us willed ourselves into existence, and none of us can sustain our existence. In a word, to be a creature is to be contingent. You and I are quite simply unnecessary. Hard as it is for us to swallow, we are simply unnecessary. None of us need be. The simple fact is you and I are contingent. To be creature is to be contingent. G.K. Chesterton, the famous British writer, <clears throat> wrote a, uh, a book on the life of Francis of Assisi. And of course, as Connor said, being a Franciscan, uh, part of the, uh, the deal in my contract with BC is I get to quote Franciscan things rather than Ignatian things uh, in my talks. Uh, so no talk of discernment tonight, uh, but let me tell you about Francis of Assisi. But uh, in Chesterton's little uh, book on Francis, which really is not so much a biography as a meditation on Francis, uh, Chesterton recounts the story of Francis going up into the hillside around the Umbrian Valley and uh, he's, at this, he's on this mountain, and he's looking out at the city of Assisi on the other side of the hill. And if you've ever been to uh, Umbria, you know what those hill towns were like. They were built with stone, thick, heavy walls for purposes of defense. Homes are all built with stone, thick and flat. And so what happens is the impression you have of Assisi perched on this hill is of this very solid, weighty mass of a walled medieval fortress city. And Chesterton says, one of the things about Francis's conversion is he begins to view the world in a different way than most people. He sees the same world, but he sees it differently. And the image Chesterton has is Francis being something of the street clown and public uh, theater personality that he was, Francis is doing tumble salts along the hill, and all of a sudden he looks out as he's doing a tumble salt, and he sees Assisi upside down. And now the very things that gave Assisi strength and security, its weight, its solidity, its mass, now, turned upside down, it hangs precariously over the abyss. A Assisi hangs there, ready to fall. And what keeps it going? And what Francis realizes is, the only thing that holds this whole city in existence is God. That's the experience of contingency. To paraphrase Thomas Aquinas, if the world were to come to an end, God would not have to do anything. For the world to come to an end, God would have to stop doing something. Because God continues to sustain the world in existence. That's what makes us alive and here. We need not be, and yet we are. So if we exist, we have been brought into life by a creator God. And as Christians, we believe that the creator's will is loving and purposeful. So because of our innate poverty, because of our lack of necessity, because we are thoroughly and utterly contingent, because of our innate poverty, that does not lead us to despair. It leads us to an appreciation that the only reason I exist is because I have been loved into existence by a gracious God. The God who need not have loved me does. The God who need not have created any of us has. That's the realization of the poverty of the human condition. It does not lead to despair, it leads to gratitude. 
you and I are simply the product of God's love. That's the human, universal reality of human dependence. And that is the fundamental poverty that makes us aware that everything that exists, including ourselves, including our enemies, is a grace. The essay by Johann Baptist Metz in this issue of the magazine was one of the very first ones I settled on, where he talks about the temptation of Christ in the desert. It's a wonderful meditation on how the incarnation is the event of the God who became poor in the person of Jesus. Very quickly, what Metz says is, when you look at the temptation narrative, what are the temptations? He says, we all talk about three temptations, remember? Jesus is tempted to have the angels come and bring you food and drink. Oh, you know, stand up here at this mountain and look at the kingdoms of the world, and they could all be yours if you would just bow down and worship. Oh, let me take you to the parapet of the temple. Throw yourself off. The angels will catch you. They'll bring you to safety. And Metz says, there's not three temptations. There's only one. It's all the same temptation. The temptation is about have all the food and drink you want. Have no material needs you'll be taken care of. It's about have power. Have more power than the Caesars. Have more power than the Pharaohs. Be all powerful. The temptation is be secure. No harm could ever come to you. There is nothing that could happen that can harm you. Be totally secure. In other words, it's the same temptation. Jesus. Don't be a human being. Stay God. The temptation for Jesus is turn the incarnation into a little piece of theater. Act like you're human, but don't really become human. Act like you are humble and simple, but stay God. Stay secure. All needs satisfied. All power at your feet. And the drama, of course, is, is that in Jesus, God becomes something other than God. God becomes like you and me. God enters into the poverty of the human condition. God it takes on neediness, insecurity, powerlessness. Christ takes it on and makes it part of his life. That's the temptation. Don't be human. Jesus is the one who confronts the poverty of the human condition most clearly in the temptation narrative. So that's what I mean by fundamental or basic poverty, theologically speaking. But there are other forms of poverty. Of course, in everyday conversation, poverty usually means material poverty, the lack of goods, that most of us need to experience a reasonable standard of living. We want security from hunger, from cold, from storms, from illnesses. Countless human beings have not had those things. Millions of people who walked along the face of this planet lacked such basic goods. Deprived of resources for meeting basic bodily needs, way too many people in our world's history have died from hunger, malnutrition, thirst, dehydration, exposure to the elements, treatable diseases. Human beings are physical beating, beings and we have material needs. The inability to satisfy such needs is a terrible evil inflicted upon those who are materially poor. The Catholic Church's teaching on human rights since the time at least of John the 23rd, has consistently acknowledged that human beings have rights not only in the realm of civil and political life, a right to peaceful assembly, to due process of law, to free speech, free press, to religious expression, but the church also asserts, as important as those human rights are, that people also have rights in the area of economic and social life. There is a right to food, to health care, to shelter, to a safe environment, to a basic education. 
So the lessons of Catholic teaching have long included a special concern for the least well-off when assessing a community's commitment to justice. The test of a good community is not how well are those at the top doing. The test is always how well are those at the bottom faring. Can people find work that provides a living wage? Is there an adequate safety net for those who are too old or too young, who are chronically ill or temporarily incapacitated? As St. James indicated in his letter, we are only as good a community, we are only as hospitable, generous, and decent a people as we are hospitable, generous, and decent to the poor among us. That's the standard of measurement if you want to know what a community is. There is also spiritual poverty in our world. One may have adequate material well-being and yet suffer from a profound sense of isolation, cut off from community, from friendship, from intimacy and love. There are those unfortunate people in our midst who are plagued by mental and emotional suffering, for whom the challenge of rising from their bed is a daily struggle with depression, anxiety, grief, despair. In our information-soaked society, there are people whose lack of a basic education keeps them on the margins of society, even if they manage to put food on their tables or find a roof for their heads. There are those with illnesses that prevent them from having the everyday interactions that those of us who are healthy take for granted, that those of us who are unburdened by diseases are able to enjoy in the way we engage one another. And the piece in this new issue that we're dealing with here that uh, I've, I've always found interesting is taken from a sermon of St. John Chrysostom, who reminds us in his reflection on the parable of the rich man and Lazarus that there are the affluent and materially comfortable who are truly poor. There are people abounding in wealth but starving in virtue. There are those who are propped up with false security, yet their eternal life is at risk. There are people living a life of easy comfort and yet find no meaning amidst the luxury. To lack the enrichment that comes from personal relationships of family, friends, colleagues, neighbors, church members, is to live a life that is stunted and impoverished to be emotionally crippled, spiritually dry, lonely while surrounded by people, is to know the dreadful state of spiritual poverty. While the external face of material deprivation is often the easiest form of poverty to recognize, it is not the only way that a poverty appears in the human situation. We Christians, we must never be indifferent to the material poverty of our brothers and sisters. Yet it is also true that we Christians ought to be among the very first to recognize the signs of spiritual poverty in our own lives as well as in the lives of those we encounter. We must remember the works of mercy are spiritual as well as material. Now, when thinking about spiritual poverty, there is an important distinction to keep in mind, and that is between voluntary and involuntary poverty. From the earliest generations of the Christian community, there were people who voluntarily made themselves poor. People who, for the sake of some spiritual good, whether that good was giving assistance to others by denying themselves, or acquiring some virtue, or engaging in repentance for wrongdoing, or deepening one's prayer life, or imitating Christ. But throughout the history of Christianity, there have been men and women who freely took vows of poverty or simply made decisions to forego material wealth for the sake of their faith. 
And when that is done in freedom, with a clear understanding of the consequences, and after a period of mature reflection, such a decision has been praised and admired by many as an act of genuine discipleship. But there is also involuntary poverty. The poverty that is not chosen, but imposed. That is not an evangelical ideal, but a countersign to the dignity of the person. Because we are integrated creatures, because we are both body and spirit, it is not possible to divide ourselves neatly. When you and I have a severe toothache, we also become impatient, ill-tempered, self-absorbed, and difficult to live with. When we are in love, the sun seems to shine brighter. The coffee tastes better. Right? The colleague at work is not so annoying. Right? Our inner and outer lives cannot be easily cut off from each other. There is a profound reciprocity between them. Involuntary poverty, physically, can corrupt our inner life, even as it makes our external life difficult. The involuntary poverty of unmet physical needs can crush the spirit of a person. True, voluntary poverty can liberate people to live a life of authentic Christianity. However, involuntary poverty can oppress people so as to prevent a truly human life. Yet another distinction to bear in mind when thinking about forms of poverty is the difference between relative and absolute poverty. The latter, absolute poverty, can be defined in ways that are connected with the experience of deprivation, whether when essential needs are neglected. Absolute poverty can refer to the failure to satisfy minimal needs of caloric intake, or the inability to find shelter adequate to prevent frostbite. Absolute poverty means the lack of goods that permit daily subsistence. It entails a state of destitution that deprives a person of essential food, potable water, effective sanitation, shelter, health, and education. It refers not only to income, but to access to goods. Tatted and shrunken as it may be, the safety net in most economically developed countries is meant to raise all people above the level of absolute poverty. The World Bank has put a dollar figure on absolute poverty in the poorest nations of the globe. It sets the standard at $1.25 per person per day. Of course, conditions in richer nations require a different standard. The United States government sets its poverty standard, according to recent figures, at $15.15 .15 per adult per day, which certainly strikes me as inadequate. Relative poverty is more difficult to define. It is determined with reference to social context, it is most commonly explained by economists and others as the percentage of a population that has less than a certain proportion of the society's median income. For example, if you have less than 50% of the median income of your society, you are considered to be relatively deprived. In short, relative poverty, you see, is really a way of talking about inequality. Relative poverty is not about survival, but it's about whether a person is able to effectively participate in the life of their society. This is not a new idea. Our old friend Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations, published in 1776, discussed poverty not as the ability to have adequate goods to sustain life, but rather Smith said poverty is the lack of whatever a nation's customs and lifestyle 
determined to be a decent standard of living. So, having a telephone may not seem to be a harsh reality. Most of the human race have managed to live without telephones. But in our culture, and we won't even talk about the people on this campus who stare at tiny screens for hours at a time, right? But in our culture, try getting a job or arranging a doctor's appointment or being contacted by your child's school if you don't have ready access to a phone. A particular culture or society can make what one culture may have thought to be superfluous can actually make it a necessary good in order to function in the society. This came home to me years ago. I was one of the people who resisted the, uh, the cell phone business. Even now, even now, I'm a proud owner of a flip phone. Uh, how nerdy is that, that you have a flip phone? Uh, but years ago, I was walking to a meeting in Manhattan, and I was walking along 7th Avenue, and I was at 7th and 34th. That's a pretty big intersection in Manhattan, if you're familiar with it. It's right near Madison Square Garden, Macy's, right? Big intersection. <clears throat> and there was, on each of the four corners, a bank of public telephones. Three phones together on each of four corners. <clears throat> I was running late for a meeting. This was before the days of my having a cell phone. And I wanted to call ahead and say, look, I'm coming, but I'm running late. I had just gotten, come up from uh, Penn Station and gotten off at Amtrak. And uh, I went to the first phone, no receiver. Second phone, whatever was on that machine, I wasn't going to put it next to my ear, right? <laughs> Over here, no dial tone. Cross the street, check there, nothing working there. The next street, I went through nine phones. Not one of them worked, not one. And I'm standing there ready to cross to the final bank of phones, and I'm at the red light, and I look at the cars in front of me, and there they are, it, five across, everybody was talking on the phone in their car. That's when I realized, Himes, you better get a cell phone, right? <laughs> but the point is, when people, when your employer, right, when your doctor, when people you have to deal with and relate with, your landlord, when people presume they should be able to get you and they can't, right, you become marginalized, you become ineffective, you become non-productive in this society. The words you've been waiting for, finally, all right? There is the issue of another distinction, and that is, how should Christians respond to the fact of the poor in our midst? How respond both to those close at hand and those halfway around the world? As many of the voices, like those of Dorothy Day or Peter Morin, both of whom are in this issue of the magazine, as their voices can be heard make clear, there's always a profound obligation among Christians to provide for the poor through charity. Almsgiving has always, always consistently been counted as being at the heart of the Christian life. Indeed, one of the most vivid of all portrayals of divine judgment, of course, is the parable of Matthew 25, where the sheep and the goats are separated on the basis of whether or not you recognized Christ in the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the sick, the imprisoned brother or sister. Charity is at the heart of Christian discipleship. However, the argument has been made that charity can sometimes just be a band-aid, put on a problem that must be addressed at a much deeper level. One description is that charity is equivalent to pulling drowning people out of a river. That's a necessary and life-giving service, to be sure. But justice goes upstream to find out why people are falling in the river in the first place and builds a safe bridge that people can walk across 
the river. Therefore, charity becomes less necessary, less urgent. If you see things that way, the advocates of justice can begin to dis demean the works of charity. That's just simply saving victims. The work of justice is understood as keeping people from being victimized. Meanwhile, the agents of charity can dismiss the advocates of justice as you people don't want to get your hands dirty by getting down and close to the poor in your midst by working in direct service to the needy. Drawing the relationship of charity and justice that way, it seems to me, is a terrible disservice to the Christian tradition. Another way to think about this is to see these two virtues, and they are both virtues, charity and justice, in the way that I'd like to suggest Benedict XVI did in his encyclical Caritas in Veritati. He describes the work of justice, and I quote here, as the institutional path. We might also call it the political path of charity. No less excellent and effective than the kind of charity which encounters the neighbor directly. In other words, justice can be understood as the political expression of charity, or it's the application of charity to the institutional and structural aspects of our life as a society. These are two complementary and necessary moments in the response of Christians to the evil of poverty. Philanthropy and personal involvement are vitally important as disciples follow in the way of the Lord Jesus. But preventing future and further poverty through necessary social reform is also a work of neighbor love. Indeed, it may be the best way that we can assist the distant neighbor whom we will never meet face to face. The documents of Catholic social teaching make clear that the Christian tradition sets charity and justice not in tension, certainly not in opposition, but rather holds them up as dual obligations for those of us who hope one day to hear the words of Matthew 25. Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. May we all as Christians be companions to and advocates for the poor in our midst. Thank you.